couple things before we get started. Um, uh, as you know, our, all our talks are brought to you by Cape Cod Five, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, Martha's Vineyard Savings. Um, all books that are available on our, uh, on our series are available over at Eight Cousins Bookseller in Falmouth. So we hope you, the, um, you uh, uh, honor the locals and uh, go buy a book. Um, if, you, if you would, if you would make sure that you um, mute yourself um, and um, so that we can listen to Mr. Puglio. And um, uh, this is one of those things where um, I'm kind of lucky because uh, um, this is one of those times our speaker doesn't really need much of an introduction since everybody knows who he is. But um, uh, for those who don't, Stephen Puglio is, um, is, he's written seven books. He's working on his eighth. Um, he's a local historian, teacher, consultant. Um, uh, you probably remember him. He's been down in Falmouth for, to talk about Dark Tide, you know, the great molasses flood in Boston, uh, American treasures, um, uh, the, the caning, um, and the city so grand. Uh, well, I also was lucky enough to have him in Marshfield for a couple of other things. So it's been my great pleasure to have him, I think, for every one of his books in, in some form or fashion. So, uh, um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to have uh, Stephen Puglio, and tonight we're going to do things a little bit differently. As you know, generally speaking, we have somebody talk for 35, 40 minutes, and we have questions at the end, and, and um, Mr. Puglio said he'd like to, he, you know, he, he misses the individual crowds, and I don't blame him. He, we, he likes the interaction, so he's going to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then um, uh, it's okay for you to unmute yourself if you want to ask him a question and we can have some, be a little more interactive on this one. So Steve, is that a, is that a good a way to, to put the rules here? So without further ado, would you welcome Stephen Puglio? Thanks, Mark, and welcome to everybody. Really appreciate you being here. Um, hope everybody can hear me. Uh, we did a little sound test before and it sounded good. So um, if uh, I see some hands raised in applause, so that's good news. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm thrilled to be in Falmouth, although I'm in Weymouth, but uh, it's great to be with the Falmouth crowd and anyone else who's joined. Uh, as Mark said, I've been down there four or five times. It's always been a great group, very engaged. And that's part of what, um, what he was talking about in the, at the beginning. We're going to talk about Voyage of Mercy tonight, the, um, the story about America's great um, assistance during the Irish Famine. And anytime I do these Zoom events, I find that people are really anxious to get in, interactive very quickly, asking questions, having a conversation, whatever. So rather than the usual live event where I talk for 45 minutes and then take your questions, um, and I think the energy in the room, you know, the audience creates the energy in the room, um, I'm going to do maybe about a 15 minute or so summary of the book. And then... Um, open it up to your questions, and I think the rest of the story can unfold as part of that question and answer session. Uh, so if that works for everybody, that would be fabulous. Um, I know you guys are not a shy group, so I'm looking forward to, to questions, and that would be great. And please do when, you, when it's time, or even now, feel free to put your video on. It's good to see you guys. Uh, some of you have it on, some of you don't, but if you put it on, it's Always, it's always nice for me to see who's there. So there you go, Mark's back on. So whenever you guys can get to it, that's great. And um, so I'll start with the summary and then we'll, we'll get right into it if that works. Um, my book, Voyage of Mercy, which is, which is si subtitled The USS Jamestown, The Irish Famine, and the Remarkable Story of America's First Humanitarian Mission, really to me is the story of two epic events. That's how I describe it. Um, uh, one just terribly, terribly sad, which is the Irish famine, disastrous, tragic, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but the, what is known as the Irish famine, that is the summer of 1846 uh, throughout 1847 and into 1848. There are several smaller Irish famines, several smaller hunger periods in Ireland, um, but when we talk about the great famine, we're talking about the the, the failure of the potato crop in the summer of 1846, and I would say for the next year and a half, uh, when things are at their most disastrous uh, in Ireland. Now, there are people who put the 
Irish famine period, historians will say it goes till 1851. Some others say it goes till 1855. You know, I, I think I maybe split the difference there. Um, but for the most part, that period from the summer of 1846, let's say until um, the end of 1847, right in that period is when things are at their worst. And so that's one side of this story. Um, the flip side of it from this side of the, of the Atlantic Ocean, the United States side, is this remarkable story of American assistance. Um, both the American government, but more importantly than that, the American people who provide this incredible amount of food to Ireland, um, starting with the voyage of the USS Jamestown in March of 1847, and continuing for about the next, next 16 months, when about 150 ships um, come from the United States filled with food for people suffering from the Irish famine. It is not only America's first humanitarian mission, it is really the world's first humanitarian mission. There were, this is a period of time when you know countries went to war with each other fought with each other, sometimes traded with each other, but never uh, assisted on such a broad scale for purely altruistic reasons, which the people of the United States do. And, and I think even maybe more remarkable, people of all walks of life here in, in the United States contribute from um, all different religions. You might expect the Catholic churches, the Catholic parishes to contribute, but these were Quakers and Methodists and Lutherans and Jews and, and um, Unitarians and any, every major religious group contributes. All kinds of walks of life, um, bartenders, saloon keepers, farmers, trappers, um, you know, lawyers, teachers, uh, orphans who are in orphanages contribute some money. Um, Native Americans contribute money, slave churches, in the South contributed uh, both food and money. And I think then geographically, it's so interesting to me on how this assistance takes place. Um, so you have people in the cities that contributed for sure, but you had people in small towns and in frontier outposts um, in the West at that time for the United States, which is about the, you know, the Mississippi River right around there. So uh, places like Wisconsin and Detroit, which was a frontier outpost. Um, and people contributed in these communities and think about how they contributed. When we contribute to charities today, we maybe go online and, and put our credit card number in or we contribute to a food pantry or we write a check. All of those are you know, very noble and very generous. But these are folks who basically grew the food, um, food that normally would go to their families or that they would take to market to sell for other reasons. And they grew that food, they harvested that food, um, or they slaughtered it if it was meat, and they, they dried it and they cured it and they put it in kegs and they put it in burlap sacks and they put it on small boats like the Ohio River and the Erie Canal and, that, and those boats went to large ports like Boston and New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore to be sent to Ireland. So this notion of contributing was really um, literally food that they would take out of their family's mouths. You know, you've heard the expression, this is almost a literal situation during this period of time. And, and Americans contribute, you know, they contribute bread and, and uh, beans and vinegar and pork and venison and bacon and ham and anything you could imagine as part of this contribution effort during the famine. So I, I call this story uh, a story of hope and generosity in goodwill uh, against this backdrop of, you know, unfathomable despair uh, that's taking place in Ireland. The famine itself, uh, I'm sure most of you know something about it. The research was so compelling for me and so interesting to me. Um, the scope and the impact of the famine, not just during this 1846, 1847, or you know, up to the early 1850s period, but the impact on Ireland and Ireland-British relations for the next 150 years, and to some extent even today, and Irish and United States relations, very different 
um, very positive um, up until, you know, pretty much the present day. So the famine itself, in terms of numbers, there were greater famines uh, in the 20th century, particularly in places like China, in Russia, uh, even in the Middle East and Africa, for sure. But in terms of a percentage of population impacted, uh, think about this. Ireland had just under 9 million people population-wise before the famine. When the famine period is over, they've lost about 3 million people, about a third of the population. About 55% of that population starves to death or, or dies from diseases uh, attendant, I would say, to starvation like dysentery and typhus, scurvy, things like that. And, the, and about 45% of that population leaves Ireland. They, they flee the great migration out of Ireland to places like other parts of Europe, some people, uh, Canada, other people, but mostly to the United States of America. Um, so that period that we're talking about from pre-famine, let's say the spring of 46, to about 1851 or two, about 30% of the Irish population um, essentially disappears and has still not come back. Even now, the, famine, the population of Ireland is, is uh, below pre-famine um, times. And so it certainly impacts the, the country at that point, but it really impacts, I think, Irish-British relations. Um, all the way until 2000, the early 2000s, and to some extent today, though I think they've improved. And those were bad relations. There was a lot of bitterness. Um, I think it affected the famine as the underpinning of most of the tensions between Ireland and Britain over the next century and a half. Um, there are other reasons. I mean, there's anti-Catholicism that goes back um, that the British that the British imposed on Ireland since you know 1695 and William of Orange and the Penal Codes, but it's that famine I think that really sets the foundation for that bitterness and the British response to the famine. So, a quick look at what we mean by that: What is that British response to the famine? Um, historians for a while called it a genocide. There was a period in Irish history when it was called a genocide. Um, I don't subscribe to that theory um, when you take into consideration the actual definition of a genocide, which is, an, which is a deliberate attempt to exterminate or exterminate um, a particular race, religion, or ethnic group. However, um, when I'm asked how the British handle, handled this famine, I say it's with a combination of incompetence, um, indifference, ineptness, uh, anti-Catholicism, benign neglect, um, you, I think, get the point. Um, they do a terrible job, particularly at the beginning of the famine. They, they try to recover much later, but it is too late. By then, the, by then the, the famine has done its job. And what happens at that time, Ireland, of course, is part of England, is part of the British Empire um, at that time. And and the British are very reluctant to send assistance to Ireland, very reluctant to, um, to suspend exports of other grains besides potatoes from Ireland because of fears that it's going to disrupt the British corn markets. Uh, very much a laissez-faire attitude. Uh, very much in many ways, the British are embarrassed of the Irish and of Ireland for being such a backward country relying on potatoes. You know, about 30% of the people in Ireland at this time relied exclusively on the potato. And, and one of the British bureaucrats, Sir Charles Trevelyan, who's responsible for relief on the British side for the crown at that time said, what hope is there for a nation which relies on potatoes? What Tre Trevelyan doesn't say is that the very reason the Irish have to rely on potatoes is due to British policy. Many of the uh, tenant farmers that work um, British-owned land in Ireland, mostly absentee landlords, um, the British slice up into smaller and smaller and smaller lots or plots the, the, the amount of um, land that the Irish can work. 
and about the only crop that provides enough yield to support a family of five or six or seven at that time was the potato. Contrary to what Trevelyan says, um, the potato for the Irish sustained health, sustained vitality, sustained economic well-being because you could sell what you didn't eat and buy a pig or a mule or a cow or a plow. Um, and so it sustains all those, those things and it sustains life itself during this period of time. So when a potato crop was abundant, the Irish celebrated. And when a potato crop was bad, as it was the year before the famine in 1845, they were worried. And then when the, on top of that in 1846, um, it's destroyed by blight, disaster strikes Ireland and strikes it very quickly. The other part of this British response um, are evictions, which is the word that has stayed with the Irish for many years. Even when they came to the United States, the word eviction carried such a poignant meaning to them and such a scary meaning to them. So many of the Irish, of course, could not pay the rent for their little cabins and mud huts that were on British owned land. So in the midst of famine, the British evicted <clears throat> thousands of Irish. And one of the searing visions among the Irish during this period of time was these poor Irish peasant farmers in the midst of a very tough winter, 1846 into 1847, freezing cold, more snow than normal, high winds, Irish wandering the countryside with no place to live after their huts had been torn down, while on the roads, um, carts would go by with crops and food laden down to be exported by the British, guarded by British soldiers. So that image stays with the Irish for years and years. Um, one historian says in 1999, think about this. One Irish historian says, the Great Famine has been the unseen guest at every Irish dinner table for the last 150 years. And so what do I mean by that in terms of the lingering effect? It's the famine that's the underpinning of the Irish independence movement in the 1920s. It's the famine that's in the, at the underpinning of the Irish government's decision to remain neutral during the Second World War. Ireland is one of like seven countries in the whole world that remains neutral. Uh, along with Switzerland and Spain and Yemen and a few others. Um, even when Winston Churchill asks the Irish to fight alongside Britain, when Britain is fighting alone in 1940, in early 41, the Irish decline. Um, the Irish government does not allow British ships fleeing from German U-boats to go into Irish ports. Um, this presents a little bit of a problem for the Irish after December 7th, 1941, when the United States gets into the war. Um, the Irish have a very good relationship with the United States, in part because of this effort by the USS Jamestown. Um, and so after December 7th, Britain's war also is America's war. And so at that point, many Irish Defense Force members essentially defect and ignore their government's decision to remain neutral and go to fight on the side of the allies. Um, this decision by them is dangerous. Some of them are uh, prosecuted when they get back. And it's not until 2012, think about that, that all of them are pardoned uh, at, a ver at very old ages uh, by the Irish government for that decision. And so the famine is the underpinning of that World War II um, tension between the British and the Irish. There's a big rock, I think it's in Donegal, um, with Erie, the word for Ireland, painted on it in huge letters. For So German bombers would know when they went over that that was part of Ireland and not part of England. So that World War II piece has as its underpinning the famine as well. And then, and then I think, you know, finally, I will tell you the the great troubles in Northern Ireland in the 70s and the 80s and even into the 90s. Um, you know, with our religious in nature, we read some of the um, 
writings and some of the uh, newspaper accounts at that time, the famine comes up again and again, the way the British handle the famine, you know, again, a century and a half early. So it is a monumental event in Irish history, perhaps the, I would say perhaps the most seminal event in Irish history was this famine. Um, and the long-standing relationship between Ireland and the United States has as its underpinning the assistance of the American people during this famine. I'll say one other thing about that before we get to questions. Um, the American government does play a role in this, but it's mostly, mostly comes in two areas. One, the USS Jamestown is a warship that Congress turns over to a civilian captain, Robert Bennett Forbes, to command this mission uh, and to turn the ship into a ship of mercy. <clears throat> so Congress does that. Congress also turns a New York ship, the USS Macedonian, over to a civilian captain. The Macedonian doesn't sail until um, June of 1847, three months after the Jamestown. Gets caught up in a lot of bureaucratic um, red tape. So that's one of the roles. And the other role is mostly an advisory. President Polk at the time, senators, uh, Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, others um, urge, strongly urge, uh, every community in the United States to set up an Irish relief um, committee. And almost every single one of them does do that. But that's really the extent of the government response at that point. Um, most of this work is done by those committees and by the uh, largesse of the American people who, as I say, donate their foodstuffs um, to Ireland at that time. <clears throat> and so that relationship, that bond, between the Irish and the United States remains very, very strong. Uh, I would say right up until this day. Uh, and again, the famine is really what's at the underpinning of that. So we're at about 7.30, which I think is, I think was like exactly 18 minutes, Mark. I did that, I think, right? Uh, so, You're good. <laughs> um, so love to open it up to questions. And, you know, as I said, we can, we can kind of have other things unfold um, as part of the questions. And I can, when I can see you guys and I can, I'd like to be able to say, hey, thanks a lot. Great question, Mark, as though we're in the same room together. So yeah. ready when you guys are. <laughs> All right. And, and, and just so you know how we're going to do this. Uh, yeah. Unmute. Well, make sure your video is on and if you got a question raise your hand and steve you can you you can call on the class as you see fit so uh, um so so if you see someone with their hand raised to uh, go for it um i'm gonna, I'm gonna start because um uh, for those that don't know uh, robert bennett forbes that steve just mentioned is kind of sort of the hero of your book if you will and and if, if you go to milton there's a wonderful museum the forbes house that's uh, that's based on him what um, well, there. What um, was it about this famine? As you mentioned, this wasn't the only famine, maybe not even the worst famine going on in the world. What was it about that, that really motivated Forbes to get involved? And what motivated the rest of, of you know, a 60-year-old United States? We're not a world power yet. We're not really an old country. What motivated everyone else to get involved with this? Yeah, it's a great question, Mark. Uh, so I'll take the big one first, which is kind of the United States, everyone else, and then we can, we'll can we talk a little bit about Forbes. But you're absolutely right. It's this moment in time uh, where I think there's this confluence of events that all come together that help the United States um, or that convince people in the United States to, to take part in this. Uh, because as you, as you know, those of you of Irish heritage or maybe not Irish heritage, you know, shortly after this, especially during the 1850s, the Irish suffer some severe discrimination when they come to the United States. So I also, I often get the question like, hey, what happened? You know, we helped the Irish in 46 and 47, and then, you know, this is how we treated them when they came here. But so this uh, period of time, a lot of things are going on that I think lend themselves to this kind of uh, assistance. Number one, particularly in the Northeast, there's a tremendous amount of angst among what I'll call progressives in the Northeast about the Mexican War and a tremendous amount of guilt. Uh, they're not in favor of the war. They see the war as a, as a way for the, um, for the South to eventually extend slavery. Um, and so there's a little bit of an effort on their part to assuage that guilt, uh, number one. Number two, we're in the midst here 
1846 is right smack in the middle of it, of many great reform movements, the prison reform movement, the mental health reform movement, the women's suffrage movement is kind of underway now. The abolitionist movement is, is getting steam here. And so this is another one of those extensions um, among that group of people, which is, you know, which includes, I would say, people from all over the country, and particularly through some of the churches that I mentioned earlier. Next, the second great awakening is happening in America, mostly with Protestant churches, where this notion that you need to give to others, that you need to help, um, you know, that God calls on you to make, to make these kinds of sacrifices uh, is all going on in the United States uh, at this time. 1846 next is also the year of decision. What is the year of decision? It's, all, it's, it's often this place where Americans start pulling up stakes in the East and moving westward. So we're still, we're still three years before the gold rush, but 1846 is the manifest destiny year, the first time that word was used. Um, and so what does, that, what does that mean? There's this feeling in the United States at the time that America is a land of great abundance, um, plenty of arable land, navigable rivers, um, coasts that are teeming with fish, and that we have this obligation to give to others. So I think all of those things come together in this period of time that, that provide that big picture and, and give you the reason as to why so many people got involved and so many people got involved so enthusiastically. Forbes, as Mark said, um, is part of that, gets caught up in that. Um, he is a experienced ship captain. Um, he has a life, I describe it in the book, a life that maybe Hollywood would love to film and to tell the story of. He, he spent um, years and years at sea, probably logged more sea miles in his life than anybody in his era. Um, between the ages of 17 and 27, that 10-year period, he said he spent about six months on land, the rest on sea. You know, he's a millionaire by the age of 30. <clears throat> he loses all of his money after the Panic of 1837. Uh, and then he becomes a millionaire again after he goes to China. And he's engaged in the opium trade, which at that point was legal. Uh, and so he recoups his fortune even after leaving his wife and their eight-month-old um, for two years. It's a pretty remarkable story, um, which is, again, a, kind of a subplot of the book, how that, that happens. So he gets back to the United States in 1841 and lives uh, a very domestic kind of life over the next six years. He and his wife have, have a couple more children, and uh, he's home. He's a ship builder. He's a ship owner, owns a small business. And then when word gets to the United States in January of 1847 about how bad the famine is uh, in Ireland, <clears throat> Forbes um, makes this decision uh, along with his brother and a couple of others um, and at a big Faneuil Hall meeting to talk about Irish relief, volunteers to head up this mission. And when he's asked why he wants to do this, he says, it's not an everyday matter to see a nation starving. And, and so that kind of launches his efforts uh, to do this. And he puts together um, most experienced sailors at that time and, and, and most experienced Navy people at that time are in the midst of the Mexican War are, are going to be involved in the, in the Battle of uh, Veracruz. And so he does have some experienced captains that he that – he, takes as his officers, about three or four of them. But other than that, basically puts together this ragtag crew that has very little sailing experience to undertake this mission to Ireland. So that's the Forbes story. It's, uh, he's an interesting, interesting guy. Okay, if you've got a question, um, uh, put your video on, raise your hand, and Mr. Puglio will call on you. Yes, Kathleen, I see you. Um, hi, I've really hi. enjoyed this. I was a few minutes late, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Um, my father's family came over during from um, Ireland in 1845. Um, okay. But um, I have a question. More recently, I've learned about 
wasn't there a Native American tribe that helped the Irish during this time? And then the Irish more recently, I think, helped them because they were really suffering during the pan this pandemic. Yeah. Great. Really? Yes. Great question. And I'm glad you asked it. The answer is the Choctaw tribe um, back oh. in 1847. And this is the tribe that was involved in the Trail of Tears in 1831, 16 years early, that made that march from basically the Louisiana, Louisiana all the way to Oklahoma. And during the famine, <clears throat> the Choctaws raised $170 and contributed to the Irish. The Irish are extremely touched by this. It's, it's an emotional kind of thing. They realize the suffering that the Choctaw went through, and they're very much touched by this, by this donation. The Irish and the Choctaw Indians develop a very strong relationship, as you say, over the next 150 years. In 1995, Mary Robinson, the president of Ireland at the time, um, becomes an elder in the Choctaw Nation, the first woman to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a statue um, in Cork of the Choctaw um, as part of this, of this commemoration. And you're right, uh, I, the Irish who, like the people of the United States, by the way, give an enormous amount of, of money to, to uh, people in other countries. Um, the Irish did help during the pandemic with the Choctaw. So with the Choctaw, and I also believe the Irish helped the Navajo. I wanna say that's the other tribe they helped during the pandemic, but the Choctaw is the original group of Native Americans that help, but that's in the book. Um, oh. It's a great story. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think um, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. From Patricia, I see your hand up, but you're on mute. So Patricia, if you can unmute, I can, I can hear you. Hi. There you, there you um, go. <laughs> I learned a lot from your book. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder that you don't call that a genocide. Just with just with the visual of these starving people and the as the soldiers. Anyway, that that's beside the point. Where how how did the how did the Americans know what to bring and was what they brought? I don't remember. Was what they brought what the Irish could eat? Wasn't there something about the corn? Yeah. So listen, I'm it's happy so to, to uh, yes, I'm happy to talk about both parts of your question. So the genocide. You know, the kind of UN definition of genocide, which the word itself essentially uh, is invented after the Holocaust. I mean, that's when the word emerges. And the, and the UN definition of that um, is, as I said, this kind of deliberate, this deliberate goal of exterminating a people or succeeding in this goal. So the, not, the Nazis succeed in exterminating about two thirds of European Jewry, right? Six million out of 9 million Jews uh, at the time. So that's, that's kind of a, a systemic goal of doing that. The British, I don't think, have that systemic goal. I largely attribute it up, I attribute the British lack of response or slowness, as I said earlier, to a lot of ineptness and incompetence and indifference and anti-Catholicism and neglect and prejudice. just, just, yeah, prejudice and just bad, um, just bad bureaucratic management. Uh, so when they finally get their act together, by the way, the British eventually do, it's about the summer of 47 and they set up all of these soup kitchens um, and they feed about 3 million Irish at that point who need food uh, on the soup kitchens. And that in itself is a pretty remarkable feat when you consider it's a country with very few internal roads. And so to set up those kinds of kitchens across Ireland and in the interior is, pretty, is a pretty remarkable feat. But they take an awful long time to do it. They spend much more time setting up the bureaucracy to feed the Irish when the food was needed the most, which was from about uh, October of 46. So the, the blight is in August. Already by October, you're starting to see starvation. From October to 46 till about April of 47 is the worst of the famine. There's no question about it. Through that whole winter, um, the British are basically twiddling their thumbs. They're not doing it with a desire to exterminate the Irish, which is why I don't use it as a, as a genocide. But they are certainly not making it a priority. 
So that's that's kind of where I come down on that, and I, I think it's an accurate depiction of it. Um, as far as the food, uh, yeah, I mean, think of every possible crop you can think of. You know, oatmeal, barley, rye, peas, hominy, all of that. Um, beans, they all go to the Irish. The Irish do have some trouble, mostly they have trouble with maize, corn, American Indian corn, if you will. It's very hard for them to digest, uh, particularly those who have been almost on a totally potato-based diet. So there's lots of gastric issues that the Irish have initially. So one of the things about the potato that's remarkable, right, is that it's a food that's very rich, not only in calories, but vitamins and minerals. Uh, it's easy to digest. It's like the perfect food um, for the Irish to be, especially poor Irish, to be using. So it takes them a long time to get adjusted to some of the stuff that comes to the United States. You're absolutely right, Patricia. Um, so yeah, um, they use, they're able to use most of it, but there are some issues, as you might expect. Yeah. Yeah. How do they how do they keep the food from rotting? Yeah, so I mean, at the Traveling. time, yeah, food is cured, dried, you know, the same way that, that you would do it in any kind of a domestic situation before freezers. There was some ice at this beginning. So the great ice movement begins around 1847 right, and 1848 right here in Massachusetts. Um, and so the ice isn't really used in a very broad way to keep the keep things cold, but it is used to some extent. But most of it is is cured, dried, canned, you know, all the things we don't do today. Uh, <laughs> so that's, which is okay with me, but I'm saying it's the way people live then, and that's how they would transport food as well. Salt was a very big preservative, right, at the time. So, yep. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Rich, uh, you're on mute, so if you unmute, I'll answer your question. Here we go. Yeah. I, I read with great interest a book that, uh, another book that you wrote, which was the Boston Italians. Um, uh, just a great book, and obviously from the last name, Yam of Italian Heritage. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of interesting that the Irish were in, in dire straits when they came in the 1850s. However, when the next great immigration came starting in the 1900s, they were in um, supreme power in, in the Boston area. Uh, interested in your comments relative to that. And, and a second question is, um, uh, I've toured and, and worked in Lowell uh, uh, many years ago, uh, and a lot of the mills up there uh, were basically um, uh, employed or uh, had employed uh, Irish women, young children from yep. Ireland. Was that about the same time frame, 1850s, 1860s? Yeah. So, all right, let me take all those questions. Good ones, Rich. I like them. Uh, so the Irish and the Italians, man, have a very, in some ways, a very similar experience, right? When they come to Boston, particularly. Um, they both settle in the North End almost exclusively, uh, for example. They both face tremendous discrimination uh, when they come here. The Irish, I think, one, the one, thing, the, one thing the Irish do, I think, is... Um, kind of break down that Catholic discrimination. The, uh, the Italians don't face the anti-Catholicism as much as the Irish did. But your point is well taken about the Irish um, mobility in Boston. So the Irish come, you know, let's say 1847 till about the Civil War, 1860, in great, great, great numbers. Um, in fact, I'll use the 1847 as an example. Boston has a population of about 115,000 people in 1847, about 37,000 of those are Irish immigrants. So there you go, that gives you an idea. And they, so the Irish gained mobility very quickly. So think about this, by about 1885, Boston is pretty much an Irish city. You know, Irish mayor, Irish congressman, they, they make upward mobility in a very rapid manner. Uh, and, you know, start to realize some of the American dream, they, they, that mobility important and the Italians follow and you know not surprisingly the Italians are discriminated against mostly by the Irish so I think that happens I think that's just a common kind of theme no matter what country you're talking about no matter what kind of migration you're talking about that often happens um, and so 
we, I say we, because I'm of Italian heritage and I married into a large Irish family. So I, I know both of their migration patterns pretty well. Uh, are much more alike than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the food, Rich. <laughs> I won't argue with you. Uh, the, second one, uh, the second part of the question, um, yeah. uh, Italian, uh, I'm sorry, Irish workers, Lowell. Oh, sure. Yes. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, 1850s mostly, and during the Civil War, too. Um, Irish workers manned those factories or, or womaned those factories. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Those, mill, those big mill towns, and then the Italians came later. So the Italians are part of the bread and roses strike, right, in the early 1900s, 1913, I think that I'm right about that. Um, but yeah, the Irish are there first working those, and it's Lawrence and Lowell, right on the Merrimack, those big mill. If you go up there now, they're still there, but they're, you know, they're obviously different things. They're not mills, but you could certainly see them, you know. I, I, I went to school up there, and, and a lot of the old school buildings up there are um, yep. uh, converted mill buildings. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Yep. Question? Herb and Eleanor, I see you, but you're muted too. Um, I was wondering, uh, what ended the potato blight? Yeah, so what ended it is is a good crop, is good crops. So, it, you know, this potato thing is sort of interesting, and I talk about it in the book. Um, it's catch as catch can. The Irish tenant farmers, you know, they don't have great farming method methods because some people say to me, "Well, after the famine, did that did they did they diversify?" Or they really didn't. In fact, there's a second major famine, kind of kind of famine light, if you will, in 1879, 1880, in Ireland, in which the United States again sends a warship converted. The USS Constellation is the name of that ship. Um, laden down with food in 1879 and 1880. So um, the Irish continue to rely on the potato. Part of that is the yield factor that I mentioned to you. Part mm -hmm. of it is the poverty and part of it is kind of a lack of, you know, uh, farming knowledge, you know, how to rotate crops. They don't have much land to rotate, don't get me wrong. So they're basically planting in the same thing. So the, the same uh, plot the potato is easy to grow, you know, the kind of nutrients it requires, um, you can plant each year. So you had decent crops most of the time, but this fungus that caused the blight in 46 and 47 turned the crop black in a matter of weeks. In fact, Father Matthew, who's the priest on the Irish side of the equation, who was the other main character in the book, um, is walking through the countryside and talks about how luxurious and abundant the crop was. And then two and a half weeks later, he's walking back the other way and sees it turning black, sees that it's turned wow. black. So it happens very, very quickly. The fungus gets into the roots and the shoots um, uh, of the potato and spreads incredibly fast. And that's, and that's what happens. It's a, the potato has, has this, um, how do I say this? I won't say the Irish worshipped the potato, but they had a reverence for it. They had a reverence for it. It was psychologically as well as physically important to them. A good crop, you know, I'd say a good crop at least brought some contentment, not, I would say outright happiness was very rare in Ireland during this time, but at least contentment. Um, so it was more than just a physical need. Uh, seeing that crop succeed was a very emotional one too. So so no one came up with some kind of pesticide or something. It no, was just No, okay. that's what I'm saying to you. No, that the famines continue in Ireland. Um, you know, until well into like I said, eighteen seventy nine, eighteen eighty, you you're now moving into a time when you do have a little bit more in the way of science and that kind of thing. But um, oh. it, you know, in some ways Ch Charles Trevelyan, one of the things he does is looks down his looks down his nose at the Irish for being backward. And so what does he mean by that? You know, in 1846, 1847, you're in the midst of the Industrial Revolution in London, right? It's a, you have factories, it's a, modernity has come to London and, and the Irish still are in a very backward country. I, you know, he's actually 
correct about that. Um, what he, what he, as I said, what he neglects to say is that in large part, that's the responsibility of the British. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a, it, the dynamic is pretty interesting. Wow. Oh, we love Dark Tide. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> Thanks. I see the I see somebody who's allegedly named Philip Robertson, but she doesn't uh, look like a Philip. No, I'm not a Philip. Philip. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a question. We had visited uh, Ireland, and there was a wonderful museum there. If anybody wants about potato famine, two things. Um, they blame a lot of the starvation on the fact that these British landowners would not let anyone go on their land, shoot any of the game, catch any of the fish, which were very abundant. Um, and so the, this also added to these people's starvation because they didn't have a, that opportunity. The other question is, how many of the men who were so poor that they were caught stealing and so on were sent to Australia on these ships, on these mm -hmm. Derelict yeah, type yeah. ships. Yeah, no, good questions, both of them. So the first, I'll take the first part of your question. You're right about, you're right about the British landlords forbidding uh, the shooting of game. The fishing, I think, was a little bit more complicated um, than that. Uh, and it, the Irish, a lot of Irish fishermen had sold in 1845, and even in a couple of years before that, when they were very light or or poor potato crops had sold some of their fishing equipment, nets, boats, tackle, that kind of thing, and were left without that, number one. Number two, there were large portions of the Irish coast, and by the way, you're right, they were teeming with fish, but there's yeah. large portions of the Irish coast, and if you've been there, you know this, that are oh. very, very difficult to no get way. to, to fish, yeah. um, be, because of how rough the seas are. And so there's a little bit of that is factored in. Now, not, I think both the reasons that you mentioned are also important, but those are, that's the other part of the fishing story. I don't know the precise number of Irish criminals, if you want to call them that, who were sent to Australia, but of course, Australia is the British penal colony at the time. That's how it starts out. Yeah. And they were sent there. Some were also sent to Canada, also a British possession at the time. And some were also sent to India also a British possession uh, at the time. And so- I, I, was, I was just thinking about the impact of them trying to recover after the famine without the men around. Yeah, and, well, there's they that were point. Farmers. Well, there's that point. And then there's, there's, the, there's the point that a lot of the able-bodied young men are the people who primarily emigrate. Right. So, I mean, sometimes they take their families, but not always. They usually call for their families or send for their families afterwards. And so a lot of young men are who emigrated. Um, so the so the problem is is magnified. I think that that way, too. The other point I was going to make when I was talking to Australia is um, the Irish pick different countries to go to uh, and for the most part, they do not want it to be part of the British Empire. So even those Irish that go to Canada, and lots do, uh, some remain in Canada, you know, some remain in Nova Scotia, you know, Halifax, St. John, that area. But a lot, the large, the vast majority of them come to the United States. They go to Canada first, and then they go to the United States. Why? Because it was less expensive to go to Canada and then sail again to Boston, New York, Philadelphia or go directly often called two boaters so any of you who have of Irish heritage and know somebody who emigrated to Canada first and then came down to the United States that's a two boater that is your ancestor so yeah they wanted almost more than anything to get out of the British Empire at that point so thank you yeah you were very welcome Yes, is it Tor? Yes, it is. Yes, Tor, how are you? This mic is working. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of uh, Irish without the work at home 
would go to, would be a, a, a significant part of the English labor force, uh, docks, factories uh, in service. Um, so I know pay scales wouldn't be great, but was there much in the way of remittances in general? And then with the famines, was there uh, capacity or capability to send remittances home? Yeah, so a couple of things. So a lot of Irish that went to Liverpool was a big embarkation point, right? So a lot of Irish that went to Liverpool um, ended up staying there because they either didn't have the money um, to cross the ocean, they, they lost their desire to cross the ocean, so they actually stayed in Liverpool and, and worked on the docks there and, yes, sent remittances home. And Irish that came to the United States sent remittances home. The remittances that the Irish sent home I would say did not match the remittances that the Italians sent home during that period of time. Italians sent almost everything they earned in many cases um, oh, home. Yeah. Uh, it was huge numbers. Uh, the, but the Irish certainly did do that. Um, not, like I said, not to the extent at one point when the Irish was sent, uh, when the Italians were sending money home right around 1906 or 07, I think it was, it, it, Italy was so poor at that time the uh, remittances for home were like were like the things that that made the Italian um, trade balance work. You know, I'm saying so. Yeah, groups and the also like sometimes from from Liverpool as well. And I mean, for the for the famine, was there capacity to you know increase the amount of that to to address some of the the famine? Uh, you know, uh, hardship. Not that. Not that. Kind of I, maxed out. Yeah. No. It was kind of maxed out. In 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 most cases, which is one of the reasons why the United States people were urged to send food, not money. Although a lot of money was sent, money was part of it. Is that food prices were cheap, much cheaper in the United States. So, what you would, what would happen if you would send food over to Ireland or to England is where you, it would go, is that it would cost much more to buy food for the Irish there. And so it didn't go as long as you, the money didn't go as, 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 long, uh, as long away as you might think, you know, or we might think. So that's one of the reasons why the United States people were urged to send food rather than money. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Um, Sheila. I, yes. Yes. Um, I was wondering what, from what port in the United States did the Jamestown leave from? Jamestown left from the Charlestown Navy Yard here oh. in Boston, uh, March 28th, 1847. Um, the Navy Yard was expanding at that point, as I said, right the Mexican during the Mexican War and after the Mexican War. Uh, the Navy Yard, which, of course, is a legendary place in its own right. It expands after the Civil War. There's 50,000 people working there during World War II. Um, so, yes, it was uh, much fanfare the day it left. Uh, a lot of Irish dock workers volunteered their time to load the Jamestown. Um, they were loading on um, St. Patrick's Day, the 17th, which, uh, which is a big symbolic day in the book. Um, Hundreds of people turn out on the 28th to see the Jamestown depart and head to Cork. So pretty remarkable kind of voyage. And when they get to Cork, um, you know, think about this. They, they pull into uh, Cove Harbor, uh, which, is Port, which is Cork, and there are bonfires up on the um, hillside. There are lamps shining from the cabins. Uh, and again, hundreds and hundreds of people um, Greek to Jamestown. It's a very celebrated journey. Uh, it's in newspapers. Everybody knows that Jamestown is coming to Ireland. And so Forbes is treated as a hero when he gets there. Uh, and the ships that follow, the 149 roughly ships that follow over the next 16 months, you know, they go into all the Irish ports, Belfast, Cork, Donegal, Galway, Limerick, Londonderry, Waterford, all the ports that you could think of, uh, American ship went into the Jamestown. Food was distributed in Cork only. The decision had been made um, here in Boston that Cork was suffering the worst. The county of Cork and Cork City 
uh, were suffering worse. And so the Jamestown cargo was all distributed within Cork. Okay, all right. Yeah, so, so the food, uh, that came in on that ship, you know, could sort of stay there in Cork because, like you said, there were other ships that went after. So they went to other ports throughout the country. That's Which, correct. Yep, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Rocco, you're, as soon as you unmute, go. So, kind of off the path, but... Uh, I was fortunate enough to be at the museums when you gave your talk about the caning. Oh, yes. And, okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, very well done. And I've read the book. Um, and, uh, but I'm curious as to your thoughts about what happened in January and what happened to Sumner when he got attacked by the congressman from South Carolina I'm not sure if there's a relationship or not, but it seems to me there's like, you know, the attack on the Capitol and the attack on Sumner. Do you see any? Um, I didn't really, I don't, I, I guess I hadn't thought about that. Um, I, I, maybe it's the time period, you know, the slavery time period that yeah. where, there, where there was that kind of tension and violence in a lot of different ways. Um, Not seeing any other hands. Any any other, any other questions or? I, I got even programmed this like, like every we, we go an hour. I think. We, um, oh, oh, there you oh, go. Look at that. I didn't even what, notice that. What? what Perfect. What, 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 one more time. Oh, um, by the way, uh, Mr. Puglio did tell me he was very cryptic, though. He is working on his eighth book. He's researching this, but he's but he was clever enough to say he's not going to tell me what it's about yet. We have to wait for the. Uh, there's a mystery brewing here. How how long did it take for you to research this one? Yeah, so I guess the research and writing is, um, if you look at it, is probably like three and a half years, uh, which is about right for me, three and a half, four years. It's right in that kind of in that in that ballpark. And so I love the I love both parts of that. I love the research part and I love the writing part. So you're right. Um knee deep in the research for book eight, which is uh very exciting to me and uh very much looking forward to um getting that story arc down. So uh for me it's all about the story for those of you who've read my stuff. Um, you need to have really good research and really good primary sources and all of that. But I also want that story to move so that you enjoy it. And, you know, when the book is next to your, on your nightstand, when you go to bed, you say, oh, let me read a couple pages. Um, and I know it won't put me to sleep all by itself. So that's really important to me. <laughs> Well, it's always a pleasure to see you. It's been great to have you here tonight. So thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, I, I, um, I'm gl glad you were here tonight. Um, uh, stay safe, everyone. Again, Mr. Puglio, thanks for doing this. Good, uh, good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thank you. you guys. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. <laughs>